folks it's tmbs 162 i'm matt leck joining me as usual alicia brooks hello hello david griscom how's it going uh let's go well uh at uh what uh henry kissinger called the dagger pointed at the heart of antarctica chile <laughs> they've chosen to nix the neoliberal constitution there so success there a uh, nice second week in a row of some success mm-hmm. uh, south of the equator we're also going to be talking to megan day about rural health care uh in this country and life after bernie uh ryan pollock uh, we're talking about the sort of labor side of the Green New Deal and a pre recorded interview with Eric Osgood. Uh, folks, it's good to talk with you. It's a week before finally uh, the vote takes place on Donald Trump, basically. That's what this vote has been set up to be about. Uh, and I hope uh, it goes against him. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you're in a swing state, particularly uh please you know do your bit and uh you know get ready for whatever happens uh next uh what do you guys think in that week out in advance uh, i think yeah. we'll probably do a little bit more in depth in the in the post game uh keep it for those folks but look it both feels like it's uh too close and and also too far away still yeah <laughs> i'm just exhausted i just need it to to happen um, happy birthday, David. Oh, thank you so much. That's belated. Happy, <laughs> happy birthday. Happy Lula Day. Um, yeah, happy Lula Day. Everybody. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, David, yeah. uh, let's talk about Amy Coney Barrett, or the I notorious mean, ACB, as I like to call her. <laughs> Look, I mean, we've been talking about the Supreme Court a lot, as you need to, because it's a very important institution in our system, and it's going to be an arena that we're going to have to do a lot of political struggle against. I just wanted to take a couple minutes before we get Megan on to sort of, you know, paint the picture of where we're at. It's not only did she get confirmed yesterday, but last night you saw by a 5-3 decision that the right wingers on the court sided against democracy. They were they basically blocked uh, people from having their votes being counted um, if they, you know, don't arrive by you know 12 p.m. Um, on on election day, which is a travesty. It's a joke. Our election system in this country is in shambles, um, and the Supreme Court has played a major role in you know in developing that system. So we're in a very bad place. There's no doubt about it. And look, and we're seeing all this kind of stuff from Democrats and pundits saying, oh, the Republican Party, they're going to regret this. No, they won't. The GOP understand that they could take control of a political organ, one that many liberals still refuse to see as a political uh, institution and control it for decades to come. We really only have one option going forward. We have to weaken the power of the Supreme Court in politics. We have the history regarding it. Look back at our interview with Matt Carp talking about the radical Republicans and their struggle against the Supreme Court. This is an old fight. The Supreme Court is an anti-democratic institution and it has been that from the get-go. Throughout its whole history, it has failed to uphold its mandate. The thing that people argue for it in civics class, the kind of civics class understanding of why the Supreme Court is good, that it protects the minority from the majority. And throughout the entirety of American history, the Supreme Court has been, for the most part, nowhere to be seen. We had a couple good years, you know, in the Warren Court, but that was one such a short amount of time. And even that did not go far enough. It's so much, it's sort of funny to even think about it, Matt and Leisha. I remember talking constantly about what we were going to do should Bernie Sanders win. And one of the biggest questions that we had to deal with was what we were going to do regarding the court. And, you know, the fundamental fact is we have to challenge the court's ability to do judicial review. That's not in the Constitution. That was a power that they asserted for themselves. Think about how difficult it's been to just defend Obamacare, you know, a kind of very boring milk toast compromise on a fundamental issue in this country, which is the lack of health care for the majority of people. Right. Think about how much of a fight it has been uh, to prevent that from legal challenges. Whatever we can rightfully say about the failure of that legislation, there's no doubt that Obamacare came out of a period uh, where there was a serious democratic mandate for change. I mean, that came out from a landslide election. And we still have the Supreme Court playing the role um, of, you know, fighting against that democratic, uh, you know, 
that democratic mandate. It's a huge problem for any kind of social progressive movement going uh, forward. And look, what you know, we're going to have to dig really deep to wage this fight. I know the mantra right now has been to pack the court. Um, I don't particularly like that strategy, not because, look, if you want to do it and what it ends up doing is delegitimizing the court, I think that's a good thing. But what is more likely to happen is that we're just going to have a constant back and forth. That's also assuming that the Democrats are able to push forward a, a court packing regime in the next two years, which honestly, I do not have no. confidence in their ability to do that. But with that, even if they're able to achieve it, that's going to be a wasted spectacle because sooner or later, Republicans will return and they'll do the same thing. And we need to avoid a situation where we have to constantly spend all this political capital having to reshape the, the court administration from administration just to enact progressive legislation, just to do what people were elected to do. You know, we you have to remember, and so people get frustrated, though, when I say that we need to challenge the power of the courts to do judicial review, because they're like, how do we do that? What's the strategy? We have to dig deep. Remember, judicial review is not in the Constitution. The civics version of SCOTUS, uh, you know, that it's going to protect the minority from the tyranny of the majority is not based on the historic reality of the court. You have to understand that what we need to start doing is building that kind of consciousness in the political movements that we're building to prepare ourselves. And at the same time is also building the kind of political movements that can come into power so that when we come into power and we say, we're going to reject the power of the court to overturn um, legislation coming from Congress, that we have laid the groundwork to do that because any kind of other strategy is just going to re-legitimize the court in people's mind. And that's the biggest problem. The court should not be thought of as a legitimate body. And you're seeing that shift happening with a lot of liberals today, um, where they're starting to talk about how oh, the court was stolen, whatever. I'm not going to spend too much time attacking those people today, right? Um, but we need to obviously push all those people a lot further on their perspective, that it's not that we need to return to some great standard of the Supreme Court, that this body has always been illegitimate. And we have 100, 200 years of history to make that argument and to start laying the groundwork for dealing with this court. Because if we don't, um, and we continue to, to allow the, the court to have this kind of you know, mystical anti-democratic power, we won't be able to put in any kind of radical uh, left-wing reforms in this country. So we can't let centrists and the incompetent democratic leadership lead us to defeatism to our movement. We can do this. It literally is not something that is dedicated in the constitution that they have this power. We just need to be smart about making these arguments and building the kind of political consciousness to start saying that the Supreme Court should not have power over the democratically elected bodies of our government. That's it, plain and simple. I mean, it's really rhymes with the way Congress has given up its oversight over war powers, for instance. Mm. Re really, all that matters, is, all that needs to be done is Congress starts taking itself seriously. Really, <laughs> like it's it's just the mindset uh, for that body. <laughs> like it's not like oh, this you you give the these the executive branch and the judicial branch, you cede as much power as you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, unfortunately the Democrats have been willing to, you know, want to play that game. And it's, it's ended in just a colossal failure, right? Like just a uh, humiliating failure. So I, I yeah, think it's absolutely. a really good analogy though, Matt, because I think a lot of people just get overwhelmed at like, how do you make that possible? And if you have a concrete, like, well, it's, you know, look here, you know, they, they step back and having this much power and control, it can be done versus like, oh, we have to pack the courts to, you know, not have short term harm caused. And, you know, yeah, I crazy. mean, and the problem is like, I think, well, we'll see. I, we'll see how uh, uh, egregious the courts are, but I think they might play it safe. And frankly, unless they're unless the courts are standing in the way of some major legislature, major popular leg uh, legislation, then I don't think like anybody is going to have really the will to go after the Supreme Court in any structural way. It's just, mm -hmm. that's just not, you're, it's the wrong end of operations, I think. Um, but uh, we do have Megan Day here and I think Wonderful. we should get to her. So uh, I'll uh, invite her to the Zoom chat now. Uh, Megan Day, hey Megan, staff writer of Jacobin. Hey everybody. How's it going? Hey, Megan, it's good to see you. It's going great. It's good to be here. It's nice to see all of your faces. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate uh, you coming on today. And, you know, there's a couple different things that I was hoping to talk to you about, um, but I think, you know, might as well just jump right into it. 
Um, I really want to just start talking to you about, you know, the state of, of rural healthcare in this country, because it's something that a lot of people miss. Um, and I think it's actually, it's a very big, you know, political opportunity. And it's also, you know, on a human rights level, it's a, it's a very needed thing that we start to address. Um, so I'd be, you know, you wrote a great piece in Jackman called um, The Pandemic is Hurting Trump in Rural America. And I was just wondering if to start with, you know, if you could just sort of set the stage. Um, we already knew that rural healthcare was in a crisis, but how has coronavirus really amplified uh, the crisis of rural healthcare? Yeah, so this kind of came to my attention when I was looking at some numbers, uh, trying to figure out if Trump really was going to win by a landslide in rural America like he did mm -hmm. in 2016. He won by a 28 point lead over Clinton in 2016 in rural America among the 60 million Americans who live in rural places. But he's only boasting a 13, 13 point lead over Biden right now. I mean, that's a pretty big lead, right? And, you know, it's, it's nothing to turn your nose up at, but it's also, it's also a pretty enormous erosion mm -hmm. of support in rural America. So the question is why? And um, the only conclusion that I could really come to, frankly, was when I started digging into all of these just reams and reams of articles and reports about the way that um, COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis has disrupted rural health care. Mm -hmm. So what you need to know about that is that it's, this is not just a matter of people who get coronavirus in rural areas. Um, that does happen. In fact, um, you know, people who live in rural areas tend to be older. They tend to be less healthy to begin with. So the chances that they're going to have a severe case of COVID-19, if they do contract it, it's going to be higher and they're going to need urgent medical care more likely. So that's a problem in itself. But it's also the case that there have been uh, there's been a huge wave of rural hospital closures over the last 15 years. Um, and one thing that happens when that happens, I mean, obviously, if your hospital closes in the nearest town to you, you're going to have to go even further to find, you know, the care that you need. But this also has a secondary effect, which is that hospitals are huge employers in uh, rural regions. So when hospitals close and leave, that causes a, a you know, a very hyper localized economic contraction that in turn causes out migration because people don't want to stay in the region anymore because there's not opportunities there. I mean, sometimes it's literally people who are nurses at the hospital, like need to go somewhere else to be a nurse, but it also has rippling outward effects. And when there's out migration, the result of that is that you have non-hospital healthcare services leaving, you know, your dentists and your regular physicians mm -hmm. and all of that. I mean, like if they don't have a population to serve, to be able to make money off of, because we don't have an NHS here, we don't have like in the UK, it's just like, you know, like a certain number of people get a certain number, number of, you know, specialists and, that, and that's that. But here it's, you know, it's run like a business. And if you don't have clients or customers, then you leave. So this is just leaving huge holes in care mm -hmm. all over the country already. And then you have the COVID-19 crisis on top of that. And that has caused a number of things. It's caused one, um, hospitals are full of COVID patients. Um, they're also trying to, you know, so socially distance. Um, they're overstaffed. Um, and so there's not enough space. There's not as much space for people who have other ailments. And then also you have your physicians and your other, you know, non-hospital healthcare services are not taking new patients because especially for long stretches of time at the beginning, because they didn't know what the protocol was and they were afraid to, you know, contract or spread COVID-19. So basically the whole thing was just a house of cards and it completely collapsed because of COVID-19. Yeah. And, and just to, you know, in preparation for this, I was looking back at some old, we did a, you know, we did it, we covered just like the crisis in 2019 and uh, a, a research that came out from uh, Navigant um, found that, you know, around 21%, this is in 2019. So this is pre-pandemic. 21% of rural hospitals were at high risk of closing. And then when you went state by state, it got really frightening. Alabama, 50% of rural hospitals were at risk of closing. Maine, 40% were at risk of closing. Michigan, 25.4% were at risk of closing. And I didn't have time to go back and, you know, sort of come through all that. But, you know, it was already set um, at a very dangerous level, certainly not prepared to deal with, you know, this kind of pandemic. And just, um, you know, because... I also want to sort of point this into like, you know, how we can sort of start advocating for people. How much does the, the profit uh, model of rural hospitals, you know, fail people and how could, you know, Medicare for all system, you know, service people much better than that? Yeah. I mean, the, the 
basic issue is that hospitals are run like businesses. And like I said before, if they don't feel that they have the client, I mean, it's, it's really, it's an actual matter of, you know, being prudent. The mm -hmm. CEOs have to be prudent managers of their bottom line. That's, that's something that is endemic to capitalism, structurally endemic to capitalism. If they don't, then they don't get to be capitalists anymore because their, their enterprise will collapse. So it's by definition, something that is their primary, it's their primary function. It's a thing that they have to do. Mm -hmm. So we run hospitals like businesses and we also run healthcare financing like a business. And the combination of those two things essentially means that, especially because in rural areas, people tend to be poorer. Um, you have people, a high concentration of people living in rural areas who are poor, who are not eligible for Medicaid in states that didn't take the Medicaid expansion. I mean, this is like an endless mm. series of crises on top of crises, basically making it not profitable to run hospitals in rural areas. Obviously, if we had, I mean, I would advocate first and foremost for Medicare for all because you know, a lot of the time the hospitals close because they just don't see the reimbursement that they're getting from things like Medicaid is just not, um, it's just not lucrative enough for them to keep their doors open. But ultimately what we need is like an American NHS. Like we need, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, po a post office in every zip code. We need to have hospitals for all of the people. If people live there, there's a hospital there. And like, you know, like, so before I was doing this kind of media stuff, I was working at like an anti-fraud organization that worked on, you know, specifically like medical fraud. And there's a huge, um, you know, incentive essentially for these kind of rural hospitals, especially in areas where you have patients on Medicaid, um, because they do end up paying, uh, you know, less than, you know, a private health insurance would. So that creates a dynamic um, that is really unhelpful for meeting human need, right? Because as you were saying, in communities where people are very poor and working class, that means that not only, um, you know, are there going to be more serious health problems in those communities, um, but also that you're just not going to be making as much as you would in, you know, say a wealthy neighborhood. And that's why you see, um, you know, all these special, very fancy hospitals in areas like Boston, um, you know, almost too many. Um, uh, and then, you know, nothing, you know, across the, the rest of the country. But what it creates is this like incentive model um, where we're basically these hospitals will like double, triple bill. So they'll come up with a million different things to build a government for, which just creates a huge burden also um, on, on the U.S. government, too, because you have these kind of private healthcare facilities uh, bilking people. So it's definitely, um, you know, a, a huge, a huge mess. And, you know, shout out to uh, um, Luke Mayville, who we've had on this show um, a couple of times. Uh, he was my professor. He's been working to expand, um, you know, Medicaid uh, access in Idaho, which is a huge problem in a lot of these right wing states that they've, you know, created the situation. Um, actually, like before we switch over to the second part, it's like, I think that that's an important point to make too, um, is that when you see people who were so frustrated with Obamacare, a lot of those people were coming out of states where you didn't have Medicaid expansion, um, you know, which created this, you know, healthcare law that was supposed to catch all people. And, uh, you know, for a lot of them, it, it really didn't. Yeah, it's a huge disaster. And I want to add also before we move on that if you really, if you break down the issues with COVID-19 and rural health care, we've only covered the first, you know, half of the issue. And I won't go into the details, but it's it's kind of intuitive. I mean, the second half, basically the first half of the issue is rural hospital and other mm -hmm. healthcare infrastructure is already so weak and has just been completely devastated by COVID. The second is that um, it's not just the infrastructure itself, the physical infrastructure, like, you know, how long it takes you to get to the hospital, but, but also um, financing. I mean, healthcare financing mm -hmm. is a disaster and the pandemic is not just a pandemic. It's also an economic crisis, which means that people are getting thrown out of their jobs, which means they're getting thrown off of their employer sponsored healthcare. It uh, means that people um, don't have the you know money in their pocket because they're unemployed to be able to pay for co-pays and premiums or like non-covered care um, that they might need. And so this problem is just, it's like actually about 20 different problems in one. And it's kind of the perfect storm of them. And I, I hope that it prompts a, a reevaluation of our rural healthcare system. At, I'm not sure that it will. I mean, we can't be too optimistic, but one thing that we can say for, for sure is that it has dampened the enthusiasm for Donald Trump in rural areas, for sure. Yeah, I would just second that. My family's from North Dakota, and it's been kind of a horror show over the course of this, too. At, when North New York was getting the spike, you have North Dakota basically... Uh, furloughing ho uh, hospital workers because they weren't get bringing enough revenue because they had to shut things down and like just complete and and then now they have to bring everybody back uh, to f fight basically our first wave now 
And yeah, I mean, it's, it's really depressing. And uh, I mean, South Dakota is one of those states, I believe, that didn't expand uh, Medicaid. Uh, I read a book, uh, I, I've mentioned a few times, but The Politics of Resentment, Rural Consciousness in Wisconsin and the Rise of Scott Walker. And uh, the exp- like basically that healthcare, Medicare for all is a, is a issue, a policy that gets you so many different people, like from the uh, uh, seasonal workers in Wisconsin, like sort of like lake regions or whatever, to farmers, to people in like deindustrializing urban areas. Like I, I, it's, and I don't know, like our opposition, we, I guess we kind of know who they are, but do you have any clear sense of who it is? Because I mean, in, New, in North Dakota, for instance, there's ho- hospital monopolies that are just eating everything up. Um, I'm just curious what you, who the sense of the enemy is here. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be just hospital. There's a lot of um, hospital mergers. I mean, there are basically large healthcare corporations. We focus so much on insurance corporations mm-hmm. because we're fighting for Medicare for all that we forget that they're not necessarily the big the only big baddies in, in healthcare. I mean, there are, you know, we, and we know their names too, right? The fight for Medicare for all has um, acquainted us all with the names of a variety of insurers that don't personally insure each of us, right? <laughs> um, I think that that's probably to the great relief of a lot of um, hospital companies and other healthcare provider companies that have kind of flown under the radar, but their time will come. We will learn their names soon enough. <laughs> um, I, I also want to add that um, I would I would like it if people would go check out the interview that I did with uh, Kathy Kramer, who wrote The Politics of Resentment, because a couple of weeks ago, I put up an interview on Jacobin with Kathy Kramer. The article is titled, We Can't Ignore Rural Voter Resentment. So um, mm-hmm. go check it out. In a way, it's actually kind of, um, it, it was to, to publish the one the one article about how Trump's support is cratering in rural America because of COVID. And then the other article about rural resentment back to back, it, they were kind of um, paradoxical, but I think they capture the kind of like spectrum of, of um, political phenomena in rural America right now. So go check it out. Absolutely. For sure. Um, well, you know, I think this actually segues perfectly um, into the, sec- you know, the, the other subjects that we wanted to uh, tackle. Uh, you just released a book uh, with uh, Micah Utrecht uh, called Bigger Than Bernie. And Jesus Christ, you know, I don't think I need to set this up too much, but sometimes I, I, it's so funny almost to look at what we were doing a year ago when there was this moment where it felt like one, you know, Jeremy Corbyn might be able to win in the United Kingdom. Um, and Bernie Sanders seemed like he was, you know, leading this movement that was destined to, to take power. And now we're in this moment, um, both in the United States and the UK, uh, where it, it feels like neoliberal, like centrism is ascended. I mean, you know, hopefully Donald Trump is done after next week. Um, you know, but in his place, we're going to now be up against Joe Biden, who really embodies a politics that honestly, I felt like a lot of us on the radical socialist left were like writing eulogies for um, a year ago. Um, so so where do you think we need? I know it's a broad question, but like, what do we need to start thinking about? Where do we need to start situating ourselves? You know, where are we without this force of Bernie Sanders, who was able to connect all of these movements across the country um, and people with one specific goal? So it's a huge question, but I do have some some ideas in large part because, you know, Micah Utrecht and I like actually sat and thought about this question while it was happening. It was a weird mm-hmm. sort of double consciousness to be thinking about what if he wins and what if he doesn't win at the same time. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying that I think that the Bernie Sanders campaign was actually sort of serving very strangely, it's very unique in political history, was almost serving in an ad hoc fashion, the function of a left-wing party. Like that, like the way that we sort of united around a program and got to build institute, uh, build a temporary institution together and develop skills and develop leadership and develop a sort of common language and a common narrative to share with each other, almost like a common, a common lore, even like a set of characters. I mean, this kind of, mm-hmm. this is really the kind of the, the cultural life of um, being in a left-wing party. And then it seemed like overnight, it was like, it was like it got louder and louder and then it just cut to white noise. Um, I think it was really jarring for a lot of us, but what it should impress upon us is the importance of building toward something like that that's more permanent, to be engaged in left-wing institution building that's durable. Um, In a way we kind of ended up, like if socialists were to drop a blueprint for how we would have liked to have gotten to the point where we were running a democratic socialist for president, we would have done it the exact opposite way. We would have started with the institution building and ended up with the candidate who was mm-hmm. disciplined to that institution and arising from that institution, right? Um, instead, 
we ended up with a candidacy that gave us a glimpse of what we've been missing and like um, a set of sort of um, I guess, uh, guidelines for how we might go about um, building left institutions in its wake. Um, so I think we need to set about doing that. And, you know, um, it's not easy. I mean, I'm not a, like a clean breaker. I'm not somebody who advocates for, build, you know, building a, a third party tomorrow. I think it's really mm -hmm. critical that when we build a third party, which I think should be the goal, um, I think that we should build a, a left-wing party that specifically advocates for working class interests, that does mm -hmm. not try to balance working class interests with capitalist class interests, that understands those are diametrically opposed, right? I don't, I don't, I don't think that, I think that when we go about building that, we need to feel like we can take millions of people mm -hmm. with us and that it can be credible. And so I think that a lot of our task right now has to be strategizing about how to get there. Um, I think socialist organizations are really critical to that. I'm not saying that, you know, for example, I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I don't necessarily think that DSA is sort of like the final vehicle. I don't necessarily think that it is the party of our dreams, but I think that it's really critical to um, putting ourselves in a better situation to actually build uh, a left-wing party mm -hmm. that can serve some of the functions that we saw the Bernie Sanders campaign temporarily serving. Um, that means that we have to focus on, you know, um, building and improving organizations like DSA. It means that if people are watching this video and they haven't joined a socialist organization, you need to understand that there's no such thing as an unorganized socialist. You're basically a socialist sympathizer and we appreciate it. We love fellow travelers, <laughs> but you got to get in there. You got to get your hands dirty, you know? Um, and, and I'll say also that it's not just about building out the ranks of organizations like DSA. I mean, it's true that um, DSA is a particular section of the working class has spontaneously started to self-identify as socialists and like mm -hmm. flood into socialist organization. And that's great. And it's very good that anybody wants to be in a socialist organization. It's also true that it's not reflective of the broader working class. And so DSA's challenge is to transform itself from a class focused organization to a class rooted organization. Mm -hmm. I stole that. It's very good. I stole it from, <laughs> you know, the idea being that like, yes, we have an organization that wants to talk about capitalism and class and that sees the working class as the agent of change. And this is nothing to sneeze at, but it's mm -hmm. also the case that there is somewhat of a separation between uh, an organization like DSA. This is not to say that we should, I mean, I, I get really annoyed when people sort of write off DSA for not being representative enough already. The point is that we have to use what we have to, to go get what we want. Mm -hmm. And so that has to be our task is rooting, rooting social, the socialist movement in the working class. I 100% I agree with that. And, and I really like what you're saying too, is like, you need to be an organized socialist. Uh, one thing, like, look, I'm, I love reading theory, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, dig deep into all that kind of stuff. But the, I get a lot of fixation, especially for people like on the online left, people who listen to the show, who are always trying to identify themselves, you know, with six, you know, hyphens, of like, I'm this very specific kind of socialist. And like, that's all great. I'm not telling anybody not to think about serious questions. Um, but, you know, people need to remember that politics isn't just something that like you proclaim. It's something that you do, right? You can't just shout on the top of the mountain, I'm a socialist and like, that's going to do anything. Um, honestly, our opponents would prefer if you were just doing stuff like that. Um, but I would just push, uh, you know, not push back against you, but anybody who is, you know, too critical about DSA, you have to understand that it's finding itself in a larger ecosystem of left wing movements. And I've, we're going to talk about this in the in our second interview with uh, Ryan Pollock. Um, but, you know, what's going on with Austin DSA, for example, is really exciting. I mean, that's a major American city that was able to defund the police and DSA was a large part of that. And it did that by creating community, not only in, in the general sense, but also with working class organizations in the Austin area, right? That's the kind of strategy uh, going forward. And I think um, I'd like to, a, a mutual, you know, uh, Ronan Burtonshaw at Tribune Magazine has this line that I always, I say it on, honestly too much, but like our job right now, I think is to convince people that politics can change their lives. Um, and I'd be curious if you had any thoughts on that, like what kind of things can we start to do? Because I think that's the jump that a lot of people have, especially like, look, I come from, you know, poor working class communities and I talk to people from where I come from all the time and they like ideas like Medicare for like, they like these ideas, but a lot of them don't vote because they don't believe that there is any real, you know, difference in engaging in politics, right? It's just kind of distraction, a waste of their, you know, afternoon or time, which honestly I understand, uh, where that kind of you know feeling comes from, but how can we bridge that gap to start to convince people that politics and organizing is a way to start 
you know, changing their actual material conditions. So there's a couple of things that I want to say in response to this. The first is that I think that an important and under theorized task of socialists is to engage very studiously and assiduously in the process of identifying reforms that are not mm -hmm. that are not so far ahead of where people what people believe to be possible that they lose their credibility and actually further demoralize people, <laughs> reminding mm -hmm. them of all the things that they definitely will not have, but they're not so close to the current reality that they also then demoralize people by reminding mm -hmm. them of the horrible, you know, like it's this idea that, you know, progressives are always kind of looking for the, the, the furthest edge of what's currently in the political discourse when they will identify with that. And then ultra leftists are sort of like very maximalist in their program and won't accept mm -hmm. any compromises. And our responsibility is to try to find that sweet spot where you're basically, you're not 20 steps ahead of the working class and you're not right where everybody is. You're like two steps ahead of the working class. Like mm -hmm. a good example of this would be, I mean, Karl Marx, as is well known, uh, advocated the abolition of uh, capitalism and, and, and exploitative wage labor, right? But like he also founded the International Working Men's Association, which took <laughs> as its you know pri primary reform that it advocated the eight-hour day. That's significantly that's that falls significantly short of of the goal. But it's also was a, a radical enough idea for people at the time that it was inspiring and inspired. The wager was that it would seem realistic enough to achieve through struggle that mm -hmm. it would inspire people to engage in struggle. And it would be in the process of that struggle that people would start to develop a sense of their own power and develop capacities as actors, as political actors. And that that would lead to more and more working class political self-activity, thus yielding the end of capitalism. Unfortunately, the latter part <laughs> hasn't happened yet, but I still think that this is a formula that makes sense. And mm -hmm. so it's our responsibility to try to like identify to have a, have our finger on the pulse of our own political context enough to be able to identify what kinds of proposals might have that kind of expectation raising quality or capacity for people. And I also want to say that it's not just electoral. I mean, it's really critical mm -hmm. for us to embed ourselves in the labor movement. Socialists need to be embedded in the labor movement as rank and file workers, trying to help engineer scenarios in which people can fight and in the process of fighting for their own material interests, develop, uh, you know, organic understandings of themselves as, as political actors in much the same way as I, as I just talked about in the struggle for reforms. I mean, that mm -hmm. can happen in the workplace as well. And that can really jostle people out of a sense of demoralization. So I think it's really critical that we be there as well. And, and how important um, do you think it is, though, that when we're building these kind of organizations that we're painting the picture or making people aware that like, you know, these are socialist movements or like socialist ideas. How attached do we need to be to like, you know, addressing, you know, this kind of word and history, for example, of democratic socialist versus just like kind of progressive. Mm -hmm. You think that's a distinction that think, matters at all? I think it's important to have organizations that um, are trying to imbue the term socialist with um, a meaning that was lost during mm -hmm. the, you know, great, 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 the great uh, neoliberal ascendance. I mean, the McCarthyism sort of scrubbed um, the, la you know, the final traces of socialism out of our popular culture. And, and, and we have a responsibility as socialists today to actually um, repair some of some of that damage. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to think that like Fox News kind of helped us a little bit when they started calling everything socialist and it kind of hollowed the term out of meaning. <laughs> yeah. And then we, we were given a blank canvas in some sense to work with, which is good. Um, but, but we do have a responsibility to resuscitate and rehabilitate that term. Some people might say, well, why would you bother? And I would say that you would bother because capitalism needs an antonym. Mm -hmm. And the antonym is socialism. And so if you're not going to work on re rehabilitating and popularizing socialism, then you're actually giving up on the prospect or the possibility of developing a mass consciousness that capitalism itself is flawed and needs to be transcended, right? So, so I think it's important to do that. Um, but I don't necessarily think that you need to you know march into every room waving your red banner i mean i think it's i think it's good to be sensitive and intelligent as a political actor no i i mean i think you're you're very right there i, I don't know i just like i get sticky on that question sometimes because it's like i think it is really important that we do as, as you were saying that like we do present ourselves as like an opposite as as to what exists like you know i was i was saying recently that you know socialism isn't a pessimistic philosophy 
um, it's actually quite optimistic that even though we're pointing out all this horror and all the failures of the system that actually out of it, something better can happen. And I think being able to paint all of our struggles as difficult as it can be to sort of see them stack up on each other um, as a part of this larger movement, is going to be really important and starting to motivate people going forward. I completely agree. I will also say that there are different, like when we're talking about electoral politics, for oh, example, of it's important that, to recognize that there are different political contexts. I mean, everybody has to be sensitive to their own political context. There are situations in which you might want to very loudly try to build on a socialist brand. In New York City, they're, in Chicago, they're building like a bench of socialist elected officials. It's important to like loudly brand themselves as part of the socialist crew, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a really critical task. There are also one-off races in relatively conservative places where you might foreground the platform and foreground the demands and then, but not shy away from someone says, are you democratic socialists? Of course, and I'm proudly yeah. endorsed by the democratic socialists of America, but you, you do have to be sensitive to context, I think. No, I think, I think you're hundred percent right there. And like, you know, one thing that I'm going to start trying to do a little bit more on this show and covering is also, you know, a second way too, which is looking at the radical history in the United States. Um, you know, especially like, you know, where I'm from in Texas, it's like, there actually is a pretty interesting radical anti-capitalist working class movements that, you know, were going on there in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And being able to say like, look, this is not some kind of foreign ideology in, in a large part, this is like deep rooted in your communities. Um, you know, being able to point to that history is so wonderful. Well, Megan, uh, I really appreciate you coming and joining us uh, today um, and definitely check out all of Megan's writing and Jack Ben. Thank you so much. Before we lose you, yes. Megan, oh. I just I just want to thank you so much for writing your article. Um, I owe a lot to Michael Brooks. It was really touching. I, I only uh, have started to read all of the articles and, and watch the tributes, and um, I, it was so beautiful. Um, so thank you for, for putting it all, all there for the internet to have forever. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I, I think um, I... I stayed up late the night after I heard the news writing it because I felt like I'd been privileged to um, catch some glimpses of what an incredible person he was and what an incredible socialist he was. And I felt like immediately after I heard the news, I was like, well, as many people need to catch those glimpses that I caught as, as possible. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for saying that. And thank you guys for carrying on this show. I mean, I love this show. People love this show rightly and you guys are doing a great job. So I, and thanks for having me on and, and yeah. please let, I'll come back anytime. We have to have you on a post game cause I want to develop um, new rom-coms in response to the romance <laughs> of, of the, you know, <laughs> yeah, America sure. article, which was so fun. Um, yeah. I want to develop you guys the, like the next major Meg Ryan, <laughs> Tom Hanks vehicle that Meg Ryan doesn't fall in love with the man <laughs> that, that's the Maybe next front that we need DSA to be fighting on. yeah <laughs> right all right um bye y'all thanks for your oh man right. that was so fun yeah definitely uh, seriously megan is a prolific writer and everything that she does is i mean staff writer engaging. is i i think you know my job of doing uh, producing all this content on a day-to-day -day basis is difficult staff writer for jacobin like that is a tough job she puts out a lot of work and she doesn't really she does it as well as anybody so yeah odds are if something comes up in the news and you want a really solid take there's a pretty strong likelihood megan's put out an article that is completely on point and brilliant yeah exactly. she does she does work which is the important thing uh i think uh to keep in mind so no exactly well before we get into our little celebration um i think it's time to do a little pitch um something that we need to continue to remember doing we're not as not i don't think all of us are as good as like hustler salesmen as michael was michael was always quick to give you the quick pitch but um you know please if you have been enjoying the show and you're not already supporting us join us over at patreon patreon.com slash tmbs you really get three to one content post games, Sunday shows, theory readings. We're really trying to expand and build that community. And one thing that's um, really been so meaningful to me over these past few years, but especially over these past few months, has been the fact that our Patreon community very much is a community. I know that's a kind of marketing word that people throw around, but it's, you know, I, it, it really means so much that not only do we have all the support, but there are, are so many great resources in that community that were able people were able to reach out to um and people in the community you know work together to create really beautiful things as well um so please if you're interested definitely try to join us over at patreon.com uh, slash tmbs 
Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to bring people's attention to, to some things that I've been working on, unless there's anything that y'all wanted to add. Just a, a quick, um, it, later on in the show, we're going to be talking with Dr. Eric Osgood, who is a patron member community and a, a doctor. And I, I was looking for someone to speak with about what happened medically with Michael. And it was just so obvious, like this would be a, a member of, of the TMBS family and team. So um, just echoing what you're saying, that the mm -hmm. community is actually a, a real thing, even though now it, it is so deeply online in lockdown. Yeah, well, it's important right now. Um, to definitely have it. It's a beautiful thing. Um, well, so just to, you know, if people haven't already checked them out, selfless plug here, but I've been doing videos with Jacobin. Um, they're really fun. They're very different. They are polished. I get a script sometimes. I'll tell you one Damn. thing. I get so nervous doing the script. Uh, it's, it's not all script. You know, there's a decent amount of it that's ad lib, but I get so nervous doing the, uh, the Jacobin videos versus this. Like it's very funny. No, I just put it up, you know, I print it like out or something. I mean, I'm not reading. It's not all script. It's like, you know, it's like pieces, you know, it's just work through and I do 10, 15 takes mm -hmm. until we get it right more, more than anything. How many just, have you done? I don't know, about five. Um, See, I feel like that's the thing. Like you say that now and like you're so nervous. I bet you like literally when you're around 15, 20, it's going to be like, oh my God, I got to do this. Like <laughs> It won't be, it'll no. be just, a, it'll be just, uh, you'll be. I mean, it's no, good experience. It's, it's one of those things that like, you know, I, I, we talk live all the time, right? And obviously that's not always going to be polished, but I get like a stutter and a lisp sometimes. Thank you so really? much, Kale. No, 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 I'm not saying on oh, this show. Oh, I'm on, saying they're on, like- no, on the take. No, I've watched your Jacobin video. No, no, I'm, but you don't see the takes that don't make it to, to the Kale, cut. I do these the like takes. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Lisa, you should know about Hollywood movie magic. <laughs> There's just I, something about I'm a doing the take. take actor, unfortunately. <laughs> trying to become a first take. But Honestly, I feel like- like, is that a term? I feel like My I'm a third take. My writing partner, Dan Robert, he's definitely a first take actor. And it's something I'm oh, envious funny. of. Like he immediately, like he feels and then it gets less. I, I, I take a minute to warm up and it gets better. I think, I think <laughs> you might be third take, David, like I. Yeah, I mean, hey, I'm a co good company then. Um, <laughs> but one just came out today called, uh, I can't remember the name of something like socialists aren't a threat to your property, uh, capital SAR sort of breaking down the fact that like, despite the fact that all these libertarians are always talking about socials coming into your apartment to take your flat screen TV, it's more likely that the bank or the repo man is going to be, Oh Jesus, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> um, you know, it's going to be the bank or the repo man who's breaking, you know, coming in to take your stuff than, than these, you know, dirty socialists. Uh, we also did a one on, um, Astrology. on s self help and, you know, the sort of problems with that under capitalism, uh, I made an argument about not thinking about in a red state, blue state dichotomy um, and a couple more. And also uh, comrade Ben Burgess does some really great ones too. His most recent on um, uh, abolish the Supreme court is really good as well. And last, sorry, not to take, take all this time. Um, I did a, I did an event with Alerta uh, New York city uh, for Lula day, uh, which is Lula's birthday today uh, with Brian Muir. We we're able to sort of break down, uh, you know, Lula's achievements, but also why he is such an important figure for the international left, but specifically also the American left going forward. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested. Um, it was a huge honor um, to be a part of. And if you're in New York City, uh, see if you can check out their uh, art gallery event at um, the Amsterdam Collective, which I only was able to see a video of it, but it was really beautiful and, you know, compelling. Mm -hmm. But yeah, are you all ready? Well, Just... anything going on on Literary Hangover that we should? Uh, well, oh, we're doing I... a, a plug tour. Yeah, what did I do? Oh, I watched a Michael Parenti uh, talk about uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar for an hour and 15 <laughs> minutes on Monday night while playing a Serious Sam 4, which is a pretty uh, extreme game, I must say. So very violent, but if you want, you can go check the replay. It's a game that you, it's take, takes place in Italy, so... That was my connection to Parenti. How was the uh, Parenti essay? People get really worked up about that one. I got to say the general, I don't know about the specific historiography, if there's some dodgy stuff going on, mm -hmm. um, if people are upset about, but the overall, just the argument, which is that like, for instance, uh, Julius Caesar like was assassinated. It wasn't because he was so tyrannical or had was so big government to use modern parlance, right? Because plenty of uh, uh, rulers after him, uh were all like that kind of big government but it was who he was benefiting mm -hmm. and you can't benefit the people and and also there's a lot of uh cicero bashing which is very interesting for me because <laughs> i i 
I like read a lot about Cicero thinking that was a way to like, you know, uh, you know, get enlightened, uh, like late high school, early college, and to find out that he was a slum lord. And, you know, that basically like learning about Cicero yeah. is is like learning it teaches the ruling class basically like, hey, if some uh, demagogue, you know, we all know what that means, like Jeremy Corbyn, basically is what they're talking about. If some demagogue takes power, p- takes power, you can look the other way when some uh, thugs do something about it because it might be better for the country. That's basically the lesson of Cicero. So yeah, um, check that out uh, with with some really extreme first person shooter action at uh, twitch.tv slash literary hangover. <laughs> Whenever uh, I think of Julius Caesar, when I was in fifth or sixth grade, my best friend's mom put on an independent production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar as a fundraiser for Ralph Nader to date my childhood. Pretty funny. <laughs> and, okay. Um, Ralph and I had some cross where he was like really like I I asked him something like from a child's point of view and he was like really aggressive and sharp about it and I really <laughs> respect him for that now. I can't remember what it was, but um, how do you not throw dumb. that in there? What's the, what's the Bernie <laughs> Sanders video? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah you, you... <laughs> I just sound like Count Dracula. That was a terrible Bernie. Yeah, All right. Good. Please bring someone new into the Zoom. Oh, well, well, we, we, actually... got, we have something to celebrate here. Uh, okay. First, this, uh, this Chile story, right? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, let's do the Chile story. Um, you want to lead us off with that? I got the media ready here. Yeah. Um, well, let's start... Um, so last Sunday, there was a referendum on Chile's uh, constitution, the Pinochet constitution, one of the most neoliberal, uh, anti any kind of basic social democracy, health center left uh, kind of you know, programs, constitution. Literally the case study in democracy and chains are one yeah. of them. <laughs> I mean, just a despicable, despicable constitution. Um, and the people came out and voted against it, um, 78%. Uh, voted to scrap the current constitution. And importantly, uh, not only will they be writing a new one, but they're going to be doing it using a constituent assembly instead of relying on Congress to write it. But I just want to set the stage a little bit if you have that first um, sound handy, Matt, because this really came out of the social movements. This was not some kind of gift that the, you know, the political class gave to people. This came out of a serious period of political struggle in Chile um, that, you know, the The catalyst moment was this hike of the subway fares that you saw these massive movements of people showing up. Um, And this is such a beautiful video from last year, 2019. (laughs) Students occupying, um, you know, a subway station, refusing to pay the fare. And you have to understand that, you know, in Chile, there is such, such debt for working class people. It's one of the most heavily indebted uh, working class, um, you know, countries in the globe because there is such, you know, an explosion of private finance, funding people's day-to-day lives there. But, you know, on top of this massive and beautiful mo- moment, honestly, I remember uh, doing a, writing a, a piece with Michael about this, comparing this to Extinction Rebellion's, um, you know, failed canning station protest and just showing like, this is how you do it. This is how you don't, um, you know, so it's beautiful to watch Super that clear. Couldn't yeah. be more clear, really. Because th- this movement really brought people in and, you know, you know, after that, you saw the two million people marching across Chile, one of, you know, the largest march in the country's history. Um, you know, you have to understand, too, like just how serious neoliberalism and privatization goes there. Private health care, private pensions, you know, in education, you have a voucher system, things like water are privatized. It's a case study um, in a failed um, system. And, you know, the protest movement argued uh, this one of the great slogans was neoliberalism was born in Chile, and it will die in Chile. And this is people celebrating um, the vote this Sunday. Just look at that zoomed out. It's so incredible. You sound like a proud new father in your voice. You're like, just look at him. <laughs> I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, you know, and it was really sweet getting messages um, from some listeners, uh, even people, you know, people from Chile, but who are living, you know, abroad, showing just massive lines in like Munich of people so excited to come out and vote. And it's not surprising um, that out of, I think, the 240 municipalities uh, in Chile, only five voted against. And those also happen to be, guess what kind of money those groups have, Matt? <laughs> uh, what financial money? I saw yeah. the Vincent Bevins uh 
uh, neighborhood breakdown of it. I was just going to go look for that. Yeah, um, by far, you know, the the wealthiest neighborhoods essentially were the ones that were voting against, um, you know, scrapping the constitution, keeping the current constitution. Um, but we got to remember that this momentum must continue as if with anything, um, you know, political, you know, this, the current uh, Chilean president who has just been a nightmare through and through. Remember, this was the person who was militarizing the police against the protesters last year. Um, you know, um, Sebastian Pinera, who, in my opinion, is like, uh, he's disgraced in his treatment and the way that he's dealt with COVID is criminal. Um, but he's coming out today saying, you know, today citizenship and democracy have prevailed and peace has prevailed over violence. This is a victory for all Chileans and all these, you know, long winded things basically saying like, this is a moment for us all to come together as a people, you know, acting as if like, oh, look at this Republican mentality that we have here. So beautiful. We can all partake. Um, And it's like, no, uh, you know, he needs to be cast aside to the dust of history. (laughs) It's, it's almost all of us, but a very small sliver of us are, are not included. And here's the had a breakdown here of its of his map of votes for a new constitution in Chile showing really widespread approval throughout the country, except for the three richest parts of Santiago, of course. So we'll just click through that. Yeah, just run the table there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's and pretty, then, yeah, this is impressive right here. That's I mean, that's like the just the sort of financial geography of a city. Yeah. So, we'll I mean, we saw a huge yeah. victory for the people. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. But, you know, it's going to be a long winded process, I think. Um, it will come to a vote in 2022. Uh, next year, there'll be a presidential election. We've seen some reports that the left parties are, are polling well, but I would say that at least the ones I've seen floating around on Twitter don't seem to be the most reliable. So let's just remember that we need to continue you know, showing support and, and preparing to help people, not thinking that this is a kind of thing that we can just put back in a bottle um, because we have there's a big fight ahead for the people of, of Chile to basically um, you know, fulfill that mandate. I love the line, you know, neoliberalism was born here, it'll die here. Mm. Good lines tonight. Yeah. Should we? Uh, I have this clip here. Uh, I'll I'll have to dub it as we go. But yeah, it's it. Allende speaking at the United Nations General Assembly in 1972, and amazing, amazing speech uh, here. And what's also amazing is the, uh, the the applause he gets after it. What do you want to say, David? I'm just saying before you put this up, I, I won't do a whole history of Allende, but people need to under who are familiar with this because some people might not be. You know, Allende, um, you know, was a Marxist who was elected, um, you know, to become the president of Chile. It was an incredible moment for the left. Uh, showing a kind of, you know, democratic socialist politics, a different way of going forward. And he was such a threat to the establishment, um, you know, in, in the United States specifically, uh, that, you know, Nixon famously told the CIA to make the economy scream. And, you know, this is one of the most overt American operations in history uh, that basically deposed Allende in a very horrifying and violent coup and put on the put forward this monster, Pinochet, uh, who enacted you know, a regime of terror, throwing people into the sea uh, for their political beliefs, all in the service of international capitalism. So if people aren't familiar with that case, they just need to understand that this was a watershed moment of American intervention in South America, and also a watershed moment in, uh, in highlighting the huge role that America has played in preventing any kind of, you know, socialist democratic movement from ever being able to maintain power, because they'll just destroy it if they have the opportunity to. Yeah, and this is an example of rhetoric that uh, puts you on the hit list of the powers that be uh, here. Um, Yeah, as I said, 1972. So uh, uh, September 11th, 1973 is when the coup occurred. And uh, here we go. Uh, And this is in, uh, again, I'll, I'll speak over this. The subtitles are there. Estamos frente a un verdadero conflicto frontal sobre las grandes corporaciones transnacionales y los estados. Uh, I'm just going to let it run, actually, guys. I think, um, folks, you'll have to watch this, um, podcast listeners. Estamos frente a un verdadero conflicto frontal sobre las grandes corporaciones transnacionales y los estados. Estos aparecen interferidos en sus decisiones fundamentales, políticas, económicas y militares por organizaciones globales que no dependen de ningún Estado y que en la suma de sus actividades no responden ni están fiscalizadas por ningún Parlamento, por ninguna institución representativa del interés colectivo. En una palabra, 
Es toda la estructura política del mundo la que está siendo socavada. Las grandes empresas transnacionales no solo atentan contra los intereses genuinos de los países en desarrollo, sino que su acción avasalladora e incontrolada se da también en los países industrializados donde se asientan. En nuestra confianza en nosotros, lo que incrementa nuestra fe en los grandes valores de la humanidad y en la certeza de que esos valores tendrán que prevalecer, no podrán ser destruidos. Yeah, so, um, and then Kissinger and Nixon were like, well, we're going to destroy it. <laughs> no, I mean, Allende is definitely, um, maybe this week I'll put up some of his writings that were translated into English. He was a very uh, incredible person and incre a great politician, but also a brilliant theorist of, of the left and, and a hero and, and a martyr. So solidarity, and I'm sure he would be very happy to see the results um, and the beautiful oh, yeah. celebration of people there. It's, it's so, I don't know, not to, we should bring Ryan on, but um, I've also been thinking about Pablo Neruda, who was another, you know, per, another communist in Chile who was persecuted, you know, who I, I believe he died just right after mm -hmm. the coup. And just imagining, you know, your final few weeks going from, you know, kind of triumphant feeling to just despair. Um, yeah, you know, that kind of, <laughs> just the amount of like death in the left of the past 50 years, right? It's it's so horrible that it's almost inspiring, right? It, this wasn't electoral defeats mm -hmm. that the, why the left didn't get power, right? Because it's not popular with people. It, when it got, when it got a chance, it was murdered out of existence. And we all know this, but it's just, yeah, you know, I guess become more and more documented. Mm -hmm. um, and it should be a sign of like in encouragement in a certain sense, right? Like they're mm -hmm. frankly going to have to do that again. I saw one response to the Chile stuff. And I can't remember who it was. I feel like Carl Bayer retweeted or something, but like, it was like, we, we like got, we literally, it, it was like, we literally removed all the communists from Chile in the seventies and it's already back. <laughs> right. You like, and it's spring you, from coming. Right. Exactly. Right. Like they, that frankly, which is a Pablo if, Neruda line, by the way, like they're going to need to murder it away again. Mm which is the scary thing i i mean i think but uh or, or we win i think mm -hmm. a long enough or they just murder the world ladder. or the world just it gets destroyed and there's you know none of it but i mean ultimately you know um fair we should have a we should have confidence in a fair fight um and then try to try to get uh seek a fair fight uh where we can get them <laughs> yeah oh well um are, are we ready here for to bring ryan on yeah, here comes Ryan now. Wonderful. I'm always hoping for an outrageous name. <laughs> hey, Ryan, how's it going? Hey, doing well. How are y'all? Pretty good, man. Good. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for everyone out there, uh, this is Ryan Pollock, um, who is a member of the IBEW uh, 520. Um, you know, thank you again for coming and talking to us. There's a couple of different things I want to to get into, but you're hanging in all right. Oh yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> it's getting a little little hectic around here um, with the election getting close and mm -hmm. all the work we've been doing, and then throw in all the the other orgs I've been getting involved in, and it's a lot of spinning plates going on right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I know you're involved in a lot of different stuff, and we're going to definitely get into that. Um, if if Matt, do you have that first piece of sound handy? Yeah, give me one second. I was thinking we would start with, uh, you know, which I've, I already told you, uh, you know, this great ad uh, that y'all put together for Mike Siegel, uh, which is a very important race and people, especially in the area should check out, but I think also nationally, it's a huge opportunity to get someone in who's a supporter of the Green New Deal. But I really like uh, the framing and the argument that you put forward here. Um, and I think we'll set up our first conversation about uh, what you were able to achieve within your local and also with the state um, AFL-CIO. 
not famous. But we've worked hard to build their shining city, to build incredible infrastructure to power this country. We've carried the American dream of billionaires on our backs. We've built their America. But I've talked to my coworkers. We can see what's coming. Floods and wildfires getting worse, plants closing. We'll lose their job. I look around at my union brothers and sisters, and every day I see jobs being obliterated with no backup plan for us to transition to something better. But I'm not going to let their America leave us behind. So I started organizing for a Green New Deal with my union. Conversations weren't easy, but my fellow workers understood. What use is a good job if you don't have a home to come home to? What use is a country if you can't work to better the lives of yourself and your neighbors? Democratic congressional candidate Mike Siegel. Welcome, Mike Siegel. Mike Siegel. I'm a former public school teacher, a union organizer, a civil rights lawyer. Unions have a saying. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. It's no surprise our unions endorse Mike Siegel. Michael McCall has already shown us who he works for. When the pandemic hit, he spent his time cutting deals for CEOs, not workers. <laughs> yeah, I think that <laughs> it's so it's so sickening to watch these people. Um, but man, Ryan, I've really been wanting to, to have you on uh, for a while and I'm really thrilled that you're here. Um, I, I really wanted to start you know, if you could sort of take us through this story of you being able to get this, you know, Green New Deal resolution um, through your union um, in Texas. And I think if you could just sort of maybe set the table as to how you did that. And then I think um, in the second part, we can talk about the strategy, because I think that actually has a lot of lessons for people in general in politics about how to talk to people about radical ideas like the Green New Deal. Uh, so I think it started by one being appointed to the Austin Central Labor Council mm -hmm. so that I was there in the first place in order to be able to do that. And the, the way I got placed into there was by getting involved with DSA first, learning how to organize through them and getting involved in the paid sick days campaign, which my union eventually became part of the coalition as well. So they started seeing me at the stakeholder meetings that the city hosted and then testifying at city hall, wearing like, you know, my, my, local 520 gear and they're like who is that guy <laughs> so that's where I get introduced to the leadership and then they later appointed me to uh I stepped up in the the coke committee and then I was later appointed to the central labor council and in doing the research I guess fast forward to March of 2019 mm -hmm. when the original green new deal resolution dropped uh about a couple of weeks later maybe the AFL-CIO energy committee which is, I believe, co-chaired by Lonnie Stevenson, the president of the IBW International. They released a memo uh, denouncing the Green New Deal resolution, saying that labor wasn't involved and you should have talked to us first. Uh, I'm not sure how true those mm -hmm. statements are, but I started asking questions. You know, why, why would they release a statement like this? Why are they so against what in in my view was so very pro-union mm -hmm. and would be a great opportunity uh my local we're inside wireman so we do new commercial construction big projects like this and it's very obvious to me how how our work would benefit from this mm -hmm. so i started doing some research looking into this talking to people and then in doing the research i discovered that uh, uh so the Alameda County Central Labor Council resolution that they passed. And I took that, tweaked the language to make it more relevant to Texas, and then introduced that to the CLC where it, you know, everyone passed it. It was, it was unanimous. There, everyone saw that was like, well, this is obvious. Why would we not want this? And and so seeing how easy that went, I was like, okay, well, the next the the Texas AFL CIO Constitutional Convention is in two weeks. I'll I'll submit it. I didn't expect anything to come of it. Um, but then a couple of days later, I got a call from the legislative director from Texas AFL CIO going, "Hey, we love this. This is great. But wow. you know, good luck, buddy." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so they did a really good job facilitating discussions and all that. And and in that whole process, we found out that there was actually some common ground and, mm -hmm. and these workers and, and, and these labor leaders in these sectors hadn't really 
heard about all the, the things that Green New Deal was trying to accomplish. You know, there's been a lot of misinformation. And then up until very recently with, with you know, shows like this and, and rising and all that, they haven't been hearing how this is actually going to benefit workers and that this is actually to protect workers. Mm-hmm. And so when you frame it in that situation, they, you know, obviously they understand that. Yeah. And like, um, just to give people a picture, you know, what kind of workers and industries are covered by your union in Texas specifically? Uh, mine does uh, inside wiremen. Um, mm-hmm. We also do uh, like if, when our city right now, we've got proposition A on the ballot that would bring commuter rails to us and, mm-hmm. and those would be electrified. That would be our work as well. Wow, yeah. So, so mass transit and all that, but also coal fired power plants. Mm-hmm. Like the oil, fan coal plant. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, cause, so you've written the story and I, and, um, and I know it has been republished and Jackman will put it up in the show notes. People should definitely read it because it's a really great example of one, you know, the kind of nitty gritty of how to do this kind of politics. Um, but two, one thing I really uh, enjoyed about this, the piece and the argument that you make in it um, was about how one, once you start talking about the just transition, how that changed the game and two, once, you know, sort of avoiding you know, buzzwords or distractions or things that people have already sort of been inoculated against because of, you know, whatever media that they're consuming, how you saw a completely different um, politics um, arising from that. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of people will tell you, you know, bread and butter politics, especially (laughs) in the uh, in the trades, you know, Um, it's 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 hard to be talking about these these progressive initiatives in the building trades but if you talk about it on on you know with bread and butter language that's much more understood and and i've been trying to explain to people what it is that i'm trying to accomplish before i give a name to it Mm -hmm. that way they're not already getting that inoculation going off you know um but uh uh yeah you know you talk about how these things are already happening, especially when like workers in Houston, you know, they've, they've, like I say in the, the article, they've had their fifth 500 year flood in five years. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very real right mm-hmm. now. My, it, it, in my local, I'm an organizer here now I'm on staff. Um, and we're getting a lot of oil field workers coming over here because their jobs are going away. Mm-hmm. They don't expect them to come back and they're not willing to bet on that. You know, they want to change. Yeah, and especially right now with what's happened with oil prices, um, you know, especially the, like the actual guys, the guys who are doing the real labor, you know, of oil production, you know, I feel like it's almost a preview of what might happen um, for folks if there is, you know, no just transition, right? Uh, you know, you start to be worried about, you know, your future and, you know, and something like we can understand, like, you know, some of the issues with the oil, hist- you know, I'll, I'll just say this, I won't put you in the position of saying this, but some of the issues with the oil industry historically, but also understand that for a lot of people, it was like a real solid job um, that gave, you know, a blue collar worker, you know, a great opportunity at getting a middle class health for some people, upper middle class, um, you know, jobs. And like, you shouldn't put the weight of, uh, climate change on those workers' shoulders. You should be putting it on the bosses and the CEOs. And I'd be curious, like it was one thing that was, we were trying to advocate on on this show, but I felt there wasn't enough fixation with on the national level was actually talking about the just transition. Because I feel like that, if we want to win, that's the way to win, because that is going to op- open up um, the field of who would be, you know, for example, a Green New Deal voter. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing we've been talking about in a lot of these coalition groups and, and um, something that I've been saying to the non-labor section of the, the groups I've been organizing with is emphasizing the, the blue green Alliance as, as they call it, because in the past um, you know, capital has been able to use workers as a wedge Mm -hmm. between environmentalists and, and getting done what we need to get done or between workers and, and, you know, what we need to be doing environment, environmentally. Um, but also uh, another thing that, that hasn't been included and, and I wonder, I question actually the, the funding of Biden's plan. It's, mm. it's so much smaller than Bernie's. Um, mm. and I don't, I don't trust that it's there. Um, 
but not just protecting these jobs and making sure that people have gainful employment, but that they're able to be gainfully employed where they stand right now so that communities aren't destroyed and we don't see another rust belt. Yeah, well, 100%. Like, I would just add that, you know, without a very robust commitment to like a jobs guarantee um, and to like the Bernie Sanders um you know, program of, you know, the real serious like version of a ju- just transition. Like I understand people having a bit of suspicion, um, you know, to a program that might leave them high and dry knowing, I mean, the thing is like, we're all Americans here. <laughs> we like don't have a lot of experience with the government programs working really well. That doesn't mean that they can't. Um, mm-hmm. all, the reason they don't is because they're undermined constantly. But I, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to make people, especially people in our world, like kind of left wing social people understand. It's like, look, a lot of people have very real worries and fears um, and a lack of trust uh, for the political establishment. And if you're not able to put that vision forward, um, you know, it's, 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 only, you know, it's in their interest to be, you know, suspicious of you. Right. And I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't blame them at all. Yeah. Um, I would just, uh, before we switch into the, the second bit of the interview, I would just also be curious what your opinions are of, because in your piece, you sort of hint at some of the difficulties between like the environmental movement and the working class and the union movement. Do you think, um, I mean, I, I assume obviously you think that there's hope for a better relationship and better development of that. Do you think we're starting to see a shift or do you think that we really need to start, uh, you know, especially people in the progressive movement, start pushing people to have that perspective more and more? I believe we are seeing a shift. I mean, I wasn't really involved in, you know, the before time, mm-hmm. but environmental groups are acknowledging that they need labor. And labor is coming around to seeing that they need to do something about this, you know, Um, since I wrote that article, uh, actually shortly after I was approached by the the president of the Texas AFL-CIO to join a climate jobs task force. And um, so far, it's it's really hopeful. And we've got a lot of labor leaders involved and and they're being educated on on the facts and, and they're all pretty much on board and and, mm-hmm. and it's really eye-opening the only ones who, who aren't on board are uh the fossil fuel <laughs> like the coal-fired power plants they're, mm-hmm. they're just not having it mm-hmm. um i suspect that's just uh you know their leadership is really close to retirement and it's it's really difficult to accept that burden mm-hmm. that you might have to shut down your coal plant and and tell your members that like, okay, listen, we have to trust in this big government program that, that we're going to get taken care of when mm-hmm. they can look to Appalachia and, and all they hear is learn to code. You know, yeah. these jobs have to be there first before they're trained on them. They, we get them the jobs, we get them in a good apprenticeship program. We make sure they're, they're well compensated so that they don't lose a, that, mm-hmm. that decent standard of living that they've become accustomed to in these uh, oil and gas jobs. No, I think you're hundred percent right there, Ryan. And I think, that, yeah, that's the only way forward. Um, I'll quote it again today. Um, but our, our friend in the UK, uh, Ronan Burtonshaw has a line that I love. And I'm telling you, it's like, it's becoming my mantra, even. It's like the progressive left, the socialist left, our job is to convince people that politics can change their lives. Um, and that's what we have to start doing. And you're only going to do that if you have a bold and radical uh, vision, um, not necessarily switching gears, but I wanted to point at two things. And I think we'll end with the, with talking a little bit about Mike Siegel and how that's going, just since we're going right into that election, it's so important that people understand. Um, but I really wanted people to understand, especially from your perspective, you know, as a union organizer, what's going on in Austin, Texas uh, right now, because it seems like there has been a huge shift in momentum uh, for progressive policies, especially around the, the recent, you know, defunding of the police, which I know uh, if people are interested in going into like the serious nitty gritty, I did around an hour interview uh, with Seneca Savoy from DSA. Love that man. Uh, yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> I didn't have to do much during that interview. It was great. Um, you know, where, uh, you know, he sort of took us through the strategies and how that was uh, developed. But, you know, for people who might not even know about this, because we were talking, you know, all, you know, before the interview about this, it's amazing to me that I bring that up and people still don't know um, that, you know, Austin was able to, to do that. And I'd just be curious what your perspective, especially, you know, coming from the union background, you know, as, you know, what's going on in Austin, Texas right now, especially with left progressive politics. Uh, I don't I don't know what we're doing differently from everybody else, but I can tell you just what we're doing. Yeah, I'd um, love to hear that. 
there's a lot of crossover um, in, in a lot of different orgs. We've got a lot of amazing leaders like Seneca, um, just just really killing it. Um, but also a lot of us have gotten very involved in labor. One thing I've noticed in, in like the South in particular, mm-hmm. um, and probably the only reason I'm here, because I only gotten started getting involved in my union a few years ago, is that because of the low density of, of unions in the South, if if you have that ambition and 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 really know how to work it, there aren't a whole lot of people standing in your way. Mm. Whereas like somewhere like Chicago or New York, there might be a lot of uh, yeah, machines, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that that just doesn't exist here. So, um, you know, people who want to get stuff done, we just get into every organization and go through every avenue. And, you know, there's there's we found avenues of funding and, and all sorts of, of other machines. We're making our own machine here, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, IBW was a big early backer of of Jose Garza, who's going to be our next oh, yeah. DA. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, and like it's a, it's a huge shift, and it's like it's important for people to just I think to pay attention to the model that we're seeing um, developed in Austin, where you, especially regarding the DSA, where you're seeing the DSA play a significant role, but is also really engaging community organizations, especially in working class parts of town, um, you know, to, to start leading the movements and to, you know, to be participating in that kind of, uh, you know, democratic way, which is really important. And especially in a place uh, like Austin, um, which has to deal with the, the difficult fact that you have you know, a Republican state government there that is constantly undermining uh, now. any kind of city program. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, that's the big thing that we've had to fight. And, yeah. you know, we won our, we won our paid sick days ordinance and then the, mm-hmm. the state came in and knocked that down. But um, I have a theory that uh, a lot of the increasing cost of living in our urban centers, like Austin, has been pushing out a lot of, uh, even progressive and, and, you know, non-conservative people out Mm. into the suburbs and rural areas. And I think that's going to turn the gerrymandering, uh, you know, right around on them. So that's, I think that'll be a big contributing factor to having the Republicans lose control. Well, God, you know, God, I hope so. Uh, Just so people know, there is a big ass billboard that they put up. I can't remember the opposition group to the defo of the police. It's like, what does it say? Like you're entering an unsafe zone. Now entering Austin. (laughs) (laughs) So, <laughs> they're so ridiculous man oh and they sweat greg kassar so much it's oh, really sure. wild well because they use really handsome pictures of them so it's great <laughs> <laughs> that is good i mean because i have to say like uh you know not to be sorry as a truck coming out um not to be too much of a stand but uh you know greg is inc- an incredible politician and really represents i think a kind of organic future for for left politics in this country which is the only way that it's ever going to happen um but, you know, in the last couple of minutes, you know, there this video that we played up at the at the beginning uh, was for Mike Siegel, who's running in a very competitive race, one that could be crucial, especially for trying to get more progressives um, into Congress um, who can, you know, push ideas like the Green New Deal forward and also to build those kind of relationships that we were talking about the first half of this interview. Could you just give people who might be hearing about this first time a kind of, you know, quick take as to, you know, what the Mike Siegel campaign is, where it is, and, you know, people want to get involved, how they can participate? Yeah, so Mike ran in 2018 in the same district. He came within four points, and that district had been deep red for, uh, I think, almost two decades. Like, nobody Mm -hmm. had come within 20 points. Um, Mike did a whole bunch of get out the vote work and and uh, a lot of finding out a lot of people were disenfranchised, like out at Prairie View A and M, which is a, mm-hmm. a, a, a predominantly black college, um, and that paid off. Also, his message it resonates with people, but it's also extremely gerrymandered. It cuts through part of Austin and then <laughs> widens up in the middle between Houston and then cuts through part of Houston. It's it's ridiculous. But he's very pro labor. Uh, he would be one of the most pro labor candidates out there. He comes from labor. Uh, his dad was a labor lawyer. His mom was a machinist, uh, unionist. He was an AFSCME, I believe, and a steward. Um, big on Green New Deal. Big on on Medicare for all. Great person. Listens to us. Like he comes to IBW and and asks us what we want. He doesn't tell wow. us what he's going to do and try to get us to sign on. That's. 
That's yeah, that's really incredible. Yeah, people definitely, especially if you're in that area, I know it's you know it's late last you know week, but um, if you want to try to get involved or donate, definitely that's somebody you should be supporting. And if you if he's uh, you know if you're in that district, definitely show up um, for Mike. If you don't mind, uh, in just like the last minute, like what's the kind of uh, feeling uh, with you and uh, you know your coworkers going into this? this election. It's been pretty impressive to see, as frustrating as it is to see, um, I will note uh, the long lines for early voting, but it does seem like there's going to be, um, you know, a, a large turnout in Texas. Uh, I was just curious if you had any kind of takes as like sort of what people's feelings are going into this election uh, from your local. Um, I mean, as, as hopeful as Texas has been seeming the last few years, uh, it never ceases to to let you down yeah so, <laughs> no, i don't so want to put we'll, you in the spot of saying it's going to be a blue wave or anything like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have to do but, a prediction yeah yeah um but yeah i mean we're feeling good the 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 future looks bright we're we're doing a lot of good things here and mm. and um i'm happy to be here in this fight you know in this, yeah. in this crazy part of the world well Man, Ryan, um, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to come on. Good luck uh, with everything, you know, going forward. You definitely would love to talk to you, uh, talk to you soon. And really, like as you know, somebody from Austin, thank you and everyone at DSA for all the work that you're doing to you know fight for those communities because we need it. All Thanks, right. man. Carry on, brother. Y'all Thanks, take Ryan. care. Thank you, Ryan. Bye. All right, that was great. All right. I love I love that like people should really read that piece because it's so on the nose. Um, they just like the moment that you know they just start talking to people about like the actual issues and avoided any kind of buzzword or anything like that. They're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's I need that. <laughs> the dress transition, I mean, really is a smart move because that it moves you past the conversation of like, are we going to do anything about it? It's like something's going to be done. Mm-hmm. And you might be left out in the cold. And so you want to get, we, we got to organize because do not trust your bosses to take care of you when the time comes. And frankly, this is a message which like my younger brother decided not to take an oil industry job because of how fickle and how uh, fragile that industry is. Mm-hmm. This is not something that those workers are unfamiliar with by any sense, of the, any stretch of the imagination. Well, yeah, I understand. I mean, what's going on in, in Texas right now is huge uh, when it comes to like the actual workers, because you've seen this glutton in uh, oil and it's a real threat to people's you know livelihoods in life and as i said like you can't blame those people like uh, you know they're they're workers and um um yeah it's definitely it's but again it's a really exciting time i i just have to say i'll hit it again it really is annoying to me how little coverage uh what's going on in austin has been getting in, in the progressive media um I mean yet no <laughs> I mean, it's 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 really frustrating though. As defund the police becomes such a major slogan of our movement, um, and you're seeing a movement that's building. It's not perfect there. Like you know, I didn't want to dig too much in with Ryan, but like you know, there are issues with like how it's being. As anything, when it goes into like a city council or government, you know, they start to water it down a little bit. But they're they're doing it on a massive scale, and it's like there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And there's just a. It's I don't know why. I have some hypotheses and most of them are just, I think people hate Texas, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I'm, going with that. <laughs> I'm curious about, um, you know, the fight with Abbott, um, you know, because I mean, the, he seems every once in a while to pop up his head with like, Oh, they're going to try to do this. And then I'm going to take this extreme autocratic measure to stop it. It's, it's, it's a bad thing. No doubt about it. The only good thing, and it's only a temporary good thing is that uh, the Texas governor, is so weak. It's one of the weakest governor systems in the in the country. They barely are in legislative session, anyways, um, which can be a nice thing when the Republicans are in power. Um, but it means that you have a very short legislative uh, schedule. Um, so hopefully, you can see a change in the state legislature um, because and, really, in Texas, the lieutenant governor is the one who has like the outsized power. Right. And uh, one thing I know, uh, I think I know about the Texas legislature is basically they have these requirements where you're going to need, because of that legislative session, another source of uh, income, uh, oh, basically, yeah. which self selects to, you know, you need to be basically a rich guy um, and have, <laughs> or have you know, some sideline of revenue. Exactly. Right. Along. But yeah. it stops corruption, I'm sure, somehow. I mean, yeah, it definitely <laughs> does. <laughs> Um, yeah, Alicia, so yeah. do you want to introduce uh, the final video before yeah, we... Yeah, uh... I'd love to. Yeah. 
Um, I, basically, my family and I got a little more information on what happened medically with Michael. And, you know, when I spoke on Majority Report, I kind of had limited uh, knowledge at the time. And I, I just know a lot of people are still really grieving and really shocked by this, you know, sudden death. And, and so uh, Dr. Eric Osgood is, uh, as I mentioned before, a patron and, and you know, big supporter of, of TMBS and has been a member of the community for a long time. And so he graciously kind of came on to have this conversation on a more medical lens. And this is more just to help people with their grieving process and gain understanding of what happened to Michael. Um, we do kind of talk about medical uh, ailments and treatments, but that this is not like medical advice. That's not why, why we're doing it. You know, we, we do go into those areas and, and there are some tips that come up, but that's not the purpose of the conversation. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh, yeah. And if, if you don't, it doesn't get terribly graphic, but um, if, if this is something that you're thinking like, oh gosh, that, that sounds stressful and uncomfortable to hear about, totally tune out. Everyone's grieving process is different. For me, it really helps to have more knowledge and make more sense of what happened. But um, yeah, definitely feel free to say goodnight now if, if that's a, a territory you, you know is not, not good for you. Uh, and uh, for uh, post game members, this is an, uh, about 25 minutes here, so we'll probably be in the post game, maybe uh, 9.30. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, so folks, uh, see you next week. And uh, yeah, go out there and uh, vote. Uh, yeah. uh, only time I'll uh, sign off like that. Um, no one twenty two in California. Yes, absolutely. Go out there and vote Definitely. against that crap. That and actually, huge. follow Megan. Megan has was talking about a couple other uh, pro, pro, propositions in California that uh, you should vote no on too. Yeah, but do I'm your preparation on that stuff. 16. I would definitely check that out too. Yeah, so you don't have to like you know post about it. Check your phone frantically as you're walking in to be like, oh, which one of who on Twitter has posted a thing where I can just know I what the vote DSA Cal LA has the guide up to. Yeah. Um, okay, folks. Uh, David and Leisha, I'll see you in uh, about an hour. Cool. Thank you both. I'm the medical director of Mission Hospitalist, which is the hospital medicine program at St. Francis. And I'm also the head instructor uh, for the medicine residency program and for the students uh, for hospitalist medicine, which is a, which is a subspecialty of, of general internal medicine. Well, we appreciate the work you're doing. And um, during this pandemic, I, I, you know, I'd like to have you come on another time and, and kind of talk about just absolutely uh, what what it's been like emotionally and uh mentally for for you and your colleagues and just a lot of that. my heart thank you for for all that you guys have been doing for for you know holding holding the fabric of our society together yeah, thank um, you so um basically I, I shared this on the sunday show a couple of weeks back but i i kind of was telling eric that i spoke very quickly on the majority report about what we knew had happened uh, with Michael. And, and the truth was it took quite a bit of time for the medical examiners to actually figure out what happened. And what we learned was Michael had not one, but two genetic mutations. So we had no knowledge of anyone else in our family having an issue with blood clots, but Michael had two genetic mutations one factor five and the other was factor two. Um, it's my understanding that factor five is pretty common um, among Caucasian people. I think something like 10% uh, often have uh, factor five. Factor two, on the other hand, is, is a lot less common. Um, and the combination of those two, this is what I was told from medical examiner, was kind of, it gave him a 20% chance of getting a blood clot or having a, you know, a bad blood clot. I don't even think that was necessarily fatal, but a, a serious blood clot. And unfortunately, the first big blood clot Michael had ended up being fatal. Um, and so I was, I kind of wanted to just chat with you, Eric, and, and just kind of you know, a, a disclaimer, Eric was not Michael's doctor. Eric is not your doctor, or I should be saying Dr. Osgood. Why am I, why am I saying Eric? You can call me Eric. You very, don't have to call very me. casual of me. It's um, all good. I apologize, but I, I, uh, I just would like you to kind of, if you don't mind, 
share with us a little bit about what it, how, you know, how we can kind of figure out if we maybe have, you know, an issue with blood clotting and just kind of good practices that um, people, again, should research and, and speak to physicians, but just, you know, kind of just general uh, good information for folks to have. That sounds good. Yeah, uh, absolutely. By the way, if you call me Dr. Osgood, I'm going to call you Ms. Brooks. Okay, so. point proven. <laughs> I, I stand down. <laughs> um, no, I, I really am so honored to be here with you right now. Michael meant so much to me. He was my hero. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure to get to know him a little bit over the last couple of years and exchange messages with him. I got, I got to meet him, and uh, this is just devastating. And as happy as I am to be with here with, with you here today, it's I'm so you know devastated that it's in this circumstance. I'm so sorry. Um, and just to the whole TMBS community. It's just it's such an amazing group that I'm, I feel so privileged to be a part of. So it's, yeah, truly an honor to be here with you right now. Um, so yeah, um, to kind of get into the technical side and to try to make it friendly to, to folks who might not have this, this kind of background. Um, Leisha, I think you laid it out beautifully. And what I'm gonna to try to do, as you said, I, I never read Michael's medical records. I was not, I never examined him, I'm not his physician, but you kind of synthesized to me what the medical examiners and doctors told you, which I then kind of processed into my doctor brain and I'm now going to try to translate back out maybe filled in a little bit more with some more robust information that hopefully people will find helpful. Because I imagine people are still reeling from the shock of finding out this information that this mm -hmm. amazing person that we all follow was lost at this young age and just what the heck happened, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, so these, these genetic mutations, as you mentioned, factor five light in the mutation, which in Caucasians and the people in European descent, roughly about a five to 8% uh, prevalence. Um, and then the prothrombin gene mutation, which is also known as the factor two mutation, is actually yeah, quite rare. And yeah, the combination is is that much less rare. And what this basically means, you know, the the bloodstream, blood, people think of it as liquid. It's it's actually connective tissue, and there's a constant biochemical balance between anti-clotting and pro-clotting factors that are vital to human function. We have to be able to form clots, otherwise we'd bleed to death all the time. Um, and unfortunately, there are genetic mutations and disorders, some inherited, some acquired, that can tip you into the direction of what we call coagulopathy, where you bleed too much. And then there's others which can push that that balance in the wrong direction of being overly prone to forming blood clots. Um, and interestingly, that in of itself is not enough to cause a blood clot. There's sort of this trio of things that has to come together, this sort of unholy uh, trio, which is number one, that what we call hypercoagulable state, meaning a state where your, your balance is tipped in the direction of wanting to form a clot, plus what we call stasis, meaning blood wants to keep flowing, wants to keep moving. And anything from being maybe immobile, moving around a little less than you normally do, going on a long trip, on a long flight, a long drive, maybe being in bed for a few days, being in the hospital, that causes stagnation. And with stagnation comes the tendency to want to form clots. And then there's this other thing that we call vessel injury, which is just something unavoidable that happens with light bumps, cuts, scrapes, everything. And when that sort of terrible combination all comes together um, with, you know, these, these disorders of clotting being one of the driving factors that raises the likelihood that's when a blood clot forms. And the, the word is uh, the DVT, which is deep vein thrombus, basically refers to blood clots, which generally form in the veins of the lower legs. And um, about 50% of the time, if not recognized, part of it can, or the whole thing can become dislodged when it then travels up to the heart, makes its way through the right side of the heart, and then goes to the lung, into the lung artery, and then can get lodged there. And uh, about a quarter of those, the, present, the, the presenting symptom, well, it's not really a symptom, but you know, the presenting clinical situation, about a quarter of those, unfortunately, is sudden death. And then about the other 75%, it can be anything from chest pains, uh, elevated heart rate, low grade fever, coughing up blood streaks, you know, uh, cough, like sputum, or, um, you know, hurting when you take a deep breath in, we call it pleurisy. And about 85% of the time that comes from the lower legs, although it can, it can come from the arms as well. Um, and yeah, so in the general population, the lifetime, so about 900,000 cases a year, roughly, and, you know, it's about one to two per thousand people will have 
um, a blood clot. Uh, in the uh, factor five Leiden population, it's more like 5%. So if you have this five Leiden mutation, still there's a 95% chance that by the time you hit age 65, you will not have a blood clot. Uh, but also, um, there's a little bit of discrepancy where you can inherit one uh, abnormal copy from one parent only, or less often you can inherit two abnormal copies of factor five, which is more serious. I don't know which was the case with Michael. And then um, these factors, uh, as they're called, are part of this cascade in the blood that's this sort of chemical reaction that results in a clot forming. And so when, when you have parts of that cascade that don't act normally, this is what, this is what can happen. And as you already mentioned, uh, that the medical examiner told you that combination uh, makes it much higher, more like like four times higher. So yeah, about 20% that by the age of 65, some kind of uh, clot will form. Um, about roughly about a third of people, uh, if they have one, will then go on later to have another within about 10 years. And um, about a third over the next several months will will have like other problems. Um, and, you know, th in in my field, which is hospital medicine, it's a little different because among hospitalized patients, med medical and surgical hospitalized patients, it's actually the leading cause of death because when you're in the hospital, you are largely immobilized. And so for, for me, it's something I have to look at much more carefully, but out in the population- So what you mean by about, that is if like someone is in the hospital and, and they had cancer treatment or they had pneumonia or something and they get a cut and they're bed ridden and then that can turn into a blood clot and they go in for one reason and they end up passing away from a blood clot in the hospital. Exactly, so they came in with a hip fracture or they came in with pneumonia or something like that. They're in the hospital and you know, all of a sudden it's day five or something like that. And that's why almost everybody who comes into the hospital, we give them a shot of medicine to thin the blood a little bit to reduce that, still uh, number one. In the general population, it's not as high up there on the causes of death, but after heart attack, it is the number two cardiovascular complication with strokes being the third. So it's, a, it's not a rare thing. So you mentioned blood thinner, and I think this is kind of one of the things where like, you know, my family and I are thinking like, oh God, if Michael had just taken baby aspirin every day, might have he, you know, been completely fine. Um, how do you know, maybe instead of asking you specifically, how do you know if you should be taking blood thinners? Cause you know, that's obviously so case to case. Are there any kind of general pointers you can give folks about just kind of uh, things that one can do to just uh, try and lower their likelihood to, of having blood clot or, and also um, kind of being able to recognize if, you know, your <laughs> the difference between you have a blood clot that could be fatal and, you know, your leg went to sleep or you're feeling like, you know, you're online being a hypochondriac looking at WebMD or whatever. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I, I hope that people can walk away with this having sort of a better sense of these things, but I, I don't want to, being somebody myself who's been prone to hypochondriasis and somatization where, oh my God, I have this going on. Is it that? I don't want to have anybody walk away from this freaking out that, oh my God, I, I want to try to help maybe people recognize when there are red flags and they should get looked at. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, if you, if you wake up and you're, you got a calf cramp. It's unlikely that that's a that that's a blood clot, you know. And and um, if you have some pain in your leg, you know these things can happen. Really, what you should be worried about is if you've recently had a surgery, if you've been immobilized, if you've been on either a transcontinental flight or like a cross country drive, some something like that, and then all of a sudden you have one leg that hurts, it might be red, it might be swollen, it's probably going to be tender. That is something that you want to get looked at. I don't know. I don't want to go too far. But I don't know if you remember who Amy Valella is. She ran for Congress in Nevada. And what made her decide to run, she was in that uh, Knock Down the House documentary with AOC and Paula Jean Swearage. And her daughter had just driven to college and she went to an urgent care center. And she said, my leg hurts. It's swollen. And so they, oh, she didn't think she had insurance. I think she actually did. And they kind of shoot her away. Oh, you know, you can go get this looked at, go find a primary care doctor. And next thing you know, she's in the hospital, blood clot in her lung, and she ended up losing her life. And that's what, oh, that's what provoked, that's what provoked Amy, I guess, to run for Congress is to fix our healthcare system. And um, so, you know, if people are in that kind of situation when they are noticing, as opposed to like, if you have swelling in both legs, that might 
be another problem. Still to get looked at, probably not a blood clot. Um, you know, if you know when it travels in the lungs, usually that's going to cause um, anything from uh, elevated heart rate, as I think I mentioned, to sometimes a chest pain that'll hurt more when you breathe in. Um, it can cause a sensation of shortness of breath. In some cases, it can actually cause what we call syncope, where you pass out or fainting. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to go on WebMD and you were to read the symptoms of blood clot, either in the leg or in the, in the lung, it will list syncope. Um, I want to be a little careful with that one, because what's interesting is that syncope or fainting is pretty common. And of all the people that come into emergency rooms with fainting, only about a percentage or so, maybe a 2% of them will have clots. But of people who have clots, about 17% of them will present with syncope. So, yeah. So if people, if, if you've passed out, go get medical attention yeah. and you'll get a basic workup. And if there are any signs of like cardiac injury or something like that, they'll work you up for, for a blood clot. So, you know, things like passing out pain and swelling, redness in the leg, particularly after being immobile, it's not going away. Go get it looked at, yeah. you know? And um, yeah, the other thing I would just say is like, a big part of you know our job as doctors is i feel like sometimes people are a little self-conscious to get medical attention because it's like oh i'm being a nuisance and i'm fine and i'm i'm wasting this doctor's time and they're just gonna tell a big important part of our job is actually like being able to reassure people when it's okay mm -hmm. and it's like people know their bodies and if you feel like something's not right and you know you maybe you try to get a little more sleep and hydrate a little better and it's just something's not right I think people know their bodies and just, you know, get medical attention. And if ultimately we look at you and everything looks okay, great. And that's, you know, you know we're, we're happy to do that. You know, we, we, that, that's like my favorite part of my job, honestly, is being able to reassure people and tell them, Hey, you just got to, you know, make some lifestyle changes. It's okay. But if it does happen to be something serious, we can prevent, you know, um, something bad from happening because untreated, um, uh, there's about a 30% mortality associated with blood clots versus if we get people on medical treatment, that goes down to about 8%. So that's a very significant difference. I think, you know, there's like cultural, obviously, you know, we live in this capitalist, you know, work, 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 achieve society. And, you know, mm -hmm. people have all sorts of, you know, propaganda in their minds around taking care of themselves, but also like, I, Michael did not mention, um, you know, he, he was tired a lot and he had headaches and that potentially might have been because he was processing small blood clots out of speculation on, on my part. But I wonder if even though he was in and out of being insured as an adult, I, like if he just thought like, oh, if I go to a doctor just because, is that going to be an astronomical bill? And you think like, oh, if, if I go in and have him check out this pain in my leg that is, it hurts, but it's like, I can deal with it. Am I going to be next thing I know, you know, $20,000 in medical, medical debt. It's, it's so yeah. opaque. Yeah. Um, so I think that's also a bit of a barrier of entry for folks. Cause it's just, you, you really don't know what's going to happen if you see a doctor. That is true. And that, that's part of the cruelty of our, of our healthcare system. And it's, this is a big part of what actually drew me to the show and to Michael, because, um, I'm a, I'm, I've always for a long time been a very big proponent of universal health care and, you know, the, particularly Medicare for all. And I've been a big advocate for that. And when I listen to Michael speak about that, it's, it, it's amazing his ability to be empathetic because you would think he had been like rounding with me in the hospital and had seen people wow. suffer in the medical system because he just got, he grasped it. Like he really grasped people's struggles. And because I work in a federally qualified health center in an inner city, um, you know, I see people who are uninsured. I have to take care of people who are undocumented a lot of time, um, you know, underinsured. And you're right. These, these barriers are serious and these co-pays, deductibles, and you know, people come in the hospital for observation. They're looking at thousand dollar bills and, yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, so maybe if I was being a little tone deaf when I tell people just go to the doctor, I, I might want to phrase that. No, you're different. right. You're not being tone deaf. Not the the companies are being it. sociopathic, you know, yeah. vampirics, you know, murderers. So the, the last thing I wanted to um, talk on, and I, I'm hoping, you know, we can have a series of conversations because I, you know, I think it's really helpful to have someone like yourself who's truly out in the field. Lots of times we're speaking about these systems and these realities but you know it's, it's very different physically treating people who are uninsured or underinsured um i want to just kind of say i i know that this segment is um probably really upsetting and 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 uh not not at all stress um reducing but i do think that uh michael during 
lockdown was a lot less physically active, you know, and I think his anxiety and stress, like all of ours had, had really gone up. And I just, I feel like, you know, we talk a lot on this program and about keeping yourself, you know, well-read and informed and, you know, involved. And I just really want to kind of put out a reminder to just like, also kind of like on Michael's last live stream, you know, just like take care of yourself, be good to each other. Like that is as serious um, in, in many ways. I'm not saying be selfish or be delusional or, you know, turn yourself off to the very stark reality we're in. But, you know, it, it like, look at Michael, like, you know, he, I, I think he actually did take fairly good care of himself, but he was totally overworked and overstressed and just kind of like, I, I think he did just kind of blow off his pain um, that he was going through. And, you know, now we're so robbed of this amazing person in mind and, you know, potentially that potentially could have been avoidable. I don't know, potentially not. But um, I think if we're going to kind of like take some sort of lesson from this, uh, again, it's a reminder of a big part of his project, which is making healthcare accessible and affordable for everyone, but also, you know, just being kind to yourself, listening to your body and, and, you know, spending, do, do what you can to reduce stress. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I would say, if people look up, um, probably within some reasonable distance of where you are is, uh, like a medicine teaching program where there's medical residents, uh, who are, who are training and learning. And usually those clinics can either be free of cost or very low cost. Sometimes they have like charity care programs where you can get access to care for not a lot of money. Uh, there's a growing field of telehealth, which I've delved into a little bit. I've been doing a bit of that, particularly during the COVID crisis, because people have been afraid to go to doctor's offices or they've lost their jobs and have insurance. I've been giving people actually free medical attention uh, this year just to, you know, to try to do a little extra. And there's, there's people out there doing that. And um, I'll, at least I'll try to give you some information that maybe you can make available to, to patrons about some, some ways that they can do that to, to be able to access care in a way that's not going to, you know, hurt them financially yeah. until our project is successful and, and we do yes. ultimately uh, achieve, uh, you know, universalized uh, healthcare that is decoupled from people's financial situation, which is what we should be fighting for. And I think we can honor Michael by continuing in on that project and also by taking care of ourselves and maybe using this lesson to, to maybe avoid, you know, blowing off some symptoms. Doctors are the worst, by the way, we are the <laughs> absolute worst. We yeah, ignore we don't, we don't, we think we can self-diagnose, which, you know, you, you can't whenever, whenever you're physically faced with an ailment, you're, you turn it into just a lay person. You don't know, but you think you do. So we're the worst at it. So I can't really talk, but um, yeah, we all get wrapped up in our lives. We, we're striving, we're fighting, we're doing our thing. And I appreciate the kind sentiment that you gave me, by the way, for the work I'm doing in COVID. I also want to honor the people out there delivering food, working at grocery stores, Amazon fulfillment centers and just everybody out there. Thank you too for what you're doing because you're you're keeping society going as well. And yeah. my hats off to everybody out there doing that. I, I salute you just as well. And you know, I'll keep fighting this fight. And you know, I appreciate everybody out there that's that's doing yeah. their thank you for, fight for doing that. The the last thing I keep thinking about with Michael, because I I didn't really think of Michael as someone who is like as vulnerable in our medical system, just because we, we grew up in Massachusetts. We had um, pretty good, I mentioned to, this to you on the phone the other day, we, we had pretty good like state health um, care growing up. And then, you know, although Michael, I think was uninsured or underinsured for a lot of his twenties, he did have medical treatment at different points. He had, you know, he had had blood work done. He had had physicals done. I never would have in a million years thought this would be a, you know, insurance story. And one thing I keep thinking about is he just didn't have like consistent medical care. There wasn't like one primary doctor that said like, huh, it's kind of weird that, you know, you're this tired compared to this time two years ago, or you have this, you know, like there, there, it's everything is so piecemeal. So even if you, you know, it's, it's amazing you're doing telemedicine with folks, but like, who knows, you, you know, you might see one person tell them something and then a year later they're living in a completely different part of the country completely different physicians. They don't have a partial uh, yeah. record. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite the task we have in front of us to both make healthcare accessible to everyone 
and also just make it a level of consistent and you know usable healthcare, not not just uh, healthcare in the abstract. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because one thing that drove me absolutely crazy during the Democratic primary. I'm used to right wing talking points against universal health. Oh, it's socialism. Oh my God, taxes. We all know they're they're unapologetic bag men for the insurance industry, but. You know, the Democratic supposedly left candidates using these like talking points, trying to talk us out of Medicare for all and, oh, Medicare for all wanted and people like their private insurance. <laughs> what, what happens is that like you could be at a job and you could have great health care insurance. And I've been through this personally. Great insurance. Awesome. We got a nice plan. Guess what? If you work in a medium size, even a pretty big company and enough people in that company and their dependents get sick. And the cost that the insurance company pays that year are greater than what they're bringing. They're going to give higher prices. And then your company might go out to the market and negotiate. You might get a brand new insurance company. And then the next year, that happened to me four years in a row. Mm. And usually doctors get like very good, you know, health. And I, I, I'm lucky enough to have good health insurance, but you might have a doctor that you like. You might be on medicines that really work for you. You, you, you form this relationship with this doctor. That new plan might not cover that doctor. Right. Now you have to go find a new one. And that could happen to you repeatedly. And so this employment-based private system that, that everyone says is so great, and they love so much, they don't realize how easily it can be swept right from under them in so many different ways. And that lack of consistency, like the old days when that doctor who knew you since you were, you know, this old or a senior, those days are largely over. That seldom yeah. happens anymore. And now, particularly with the Affordable Care Act, because they've had to keep the private insurance profiteering in play, the way that they've made these costs work is that they've used these electronic health records and people might have noticed over the last decade or so when you go to see the doctor there used to be a time when your doctor would come and like look you in the eye and you felt like you were being healed and you, you might notice now you go to a doctor's office and like they just sit at a computer and they're kind of typing things yeah. in and like, like, oh. asking questions and, da, 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 and blood pressure looks a little high yeah. <laughs> it's not because we it's not because doctors hate looking at patients in the eye or that we don't think verbal cues are important it's that they're being forced to practice that way by this yeah. for-profit system that is right. forcing them to create document output that makes you look as sick as you can so we can bill more and see as many people an hour and so this just getting people nominally insured through this piecemeal neoliberal stuff ain't good enough because stuff gets missed that way yeah. And while, yeah, like 30,000 people a year, I think, die because they can't get to a doctor, in my field, the number three cause of death is actually what we call iatrogenic, meaning harm at the hands of medicine. Mm -hmm. So like side effects, you know, preventable medical errors. Mm -hmm. And it's because we have this profit-based system where insurance companies are dictating how much time to spend with your patient. And it's, it's this factory system. And so it just further shows you how important it is to push for this universalized single payer healthcare so that we can take all these uh, money making middlemen out of the way and actually just let that, you know, that doctor patient sacred ancient relationship really reform again in, in the richest country in the world that should not be considered far fetched. Yeah, absolutely. Really well said and a really good reminder that it's something we just have to keep fighting for and, um, you know, not, not, not lose steam because it is life or death for so, so many folks. Um, thanks for the Against the Web uh, shout out. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. And um, yeah, look forward to future conversations. And likewise. so appreciate your time and, and your practice. Oh, likewise. Thank you so much, Alicia. All right. Take care. Bye.